Welcome everyone back to another episode. We are talking to Teresa Trigas Pfefferly today, or you go by TTP. Um, joining me as usual is my business partner, Jeffrey Califut. Califut. Um, <laughs> but uh, Teresa, thank you so much for, for joining us. Uh, Teresa has been a real estate agent for over 20 years, real estate investor, wife, mother, coach, mentor, and friend, we have uh, we've done some interesting transactions together over over the years, and um, we want to talk to you about real estate investing. You have uh, you've done a lot in your career, and we want to pick your brain on the ins and outs of real estate investing, and what you and also what you've learned uh, along the way of what to do and what not to do, and some of uh, and some of those different scenarios. So, Teresa, thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. I, and you say that, you say I've done a lot and I feel like I have this like barometer inside that says I'm not doing enough. Right. I, I Honestly, I think every entrepreneur, doesn't matter what field they are in, I think that is a plus in the individual because it keeps them motivated and keeps them going. So as much as it's, it's a curse, because I wake up with it every single day, it is also a blessing. So I truly uh, I truly understand what, you're, what you mean by that. I'm trying sure. to, somebody, I read something re this week. I read mm -hmm. something that said, mirroring what you just said, right? Blessing and a yeah. curse. Yes. But that that maybe sh for those of us who do that mm -hmm. shifting the i'm not doing enough to being grateful for the things that you did do that day or that yep. you have done in your career mm -hmm. is much kinder to yourself for and, sure and and then helps you to stay in a place of gratitude and of yep. course we all know no matter what you're doing in life whether you're a doctor or a real estate broker or investor, that staying in a place of gratitude keeps you in the highest vibration possible. For sure. Being in your highest vibration brings more to you. Without a doubt. Um, I couldn't agree with you more because um, with that mindset or that that train of thought that a lot of entrepreneurs have, it can spiral into a, a, a negative mindset that can be counterproductive. So as long as you understand the tools that you have um, in regards to that urge to continuously feel like you're accomplishing something, um, it can be, like I said, counterproductive to where it spirals into a negative thing and you don't do end up doing anything. And then it compounds over time and you're just stuck. You're frozen. Yeah. Right. So that's yeah. the worst thing that can happen. I mean, I, I, I wake up every day thinking if I'm comfortable, I'm uncomfortable now. Yeah, I need to push through the, you know, it's like, okay, am I doing enough? And it, it can spiral very quickly out of control. So yes, it's like teetering on that edge yeah. it, it, all the time, <laughs> all the time. So Teresa, what, when would you say you, so obviously you've been in real estate for a while. When did you go from real estate agent to really start considering real estate investing? I was thinking about that this morning in the car knowing that we were going to talk. And mm -hmm. um, I think that it was probably five years before I actually pulled the trigger okay. on investing that I was thinking about it and it was kind of mulling inside of me. And I thought that it, I don't even think I'll be real with you. I don't mm -hmm. even think it was a intellectual decision initially right initially when it was coming up out of me it was just it seemed like what it was just came out of my mouth right like oh i want to invest in this town i just think this would be a great investment mm -hmm. i had no idea what i was talking about like <laughs> zero point zero right and so it was there it was already it was you know it was in here somewhere right um and then I took my first bold class. Mm -hmm. I want to say in, in 2015. And I remember it, it came up again, you know, in writing your, you know, you write out like we all do in different exercises, right? We write yeah. down what we want to see our future look like in the next five years, 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I wrote it down real estate investing, right? Yep. I wrote down wholesaling. 
um, I wrote down multifamily and I, I just wrote these things down and then had no context for. Right. And within, I would say probably a, a year, within a year of writing it down, mm -hmm. I wholesaled my first property. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so, so the mindset was there. The pieces were just kind of falling into place and subconsciously, you knew what you wanted to do. And then all of a sudden, consciously, the opportunity came, came to fruition and you just, you kind of seized it. Yes. Right. Like, well, I'm um, curious what, what held you back though? That, what was I the, think what Jeff, the I, it's funny. Been? So I think it was that I, I'm, so this is like, you know, we all talk about, like I just said, right. We talk about the things, right. So for 2024, mm -hmm. one of my things was purposeful and mm -hmm. In being purposeful, I recognize that I need to spend CEO time with myself. Mm. That I wake up and I go right on, right onto the hamster wheel of my to-do list. Yep. And the gaps in my life are because I'm not sa keeping sacred me. Right. And taking 20 minutes to write down what do I, what, who am I today? Mm-hmm. And, and who do I want to be to the world around me? And what is my why? And, and what do I want to accomplish? And I, for, because I lacked that, right. It took me time right. yep. to manifest it because I, the universe is only going to give me what I'm ready for in that True. moment. So had I had that skill all those many years ago in 2004 was probably the first time I said, I want to invest. Right. Um, had I had that knowledge, that ability to do that, I would be reading books. I would be putting mm -hmm. myself in rooms with other real estate investors. I would mm -hmm. be watching YouTubes. I would be, you know, just cultivating knowledge. Right. So that it could come out of me faster. Right. So I think that's it, Jeff. I think holding yeah. myself back is really not spending enough time with myself and, and like making yep. time to It to makes sense because so, so many people get stuck in that moment. How many people talk about investing, especially in our industry alone, right? Mm -hmm. Very few people in our industry actually do it themselves. Sure. Yeah. Right. They, they get, they get caught, they get stuck. They don't, they lack confidence. They analysis they paralysis. Think, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Analysis paralysis big time. Yeah. yeah, I think I think after the wholesale. So, you know, there's this whole other conversation <laughs> <laughs> about marriage <laughs> and, <laughs> and having a partner who's on the same page as you and getting you both to the same place. Right. Right. So right. I'd love to be able to be like, I'm a rock star female and I don't care what my husband says and I'm going to do whatever. But that also doesn't make for a cohesive right at times. And right. so my husband, and I, we had to lose like five deals, five multifamily deals in order for him, for me to, me to learn how much I could push him mm -hmm. and for him to stop analyzing and just do it. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that, uh, it's interesting. It's like almost like a, a yin and yang. I mean, it's, it's coming to the point where you run numbers so much and you analyze the property so much that you're never going to completely, uh, know the unknown. And you almost have to sometimes analyze certain things to a point and then take a leap of faith of what, what you think things could become from an up from an opportunity. So it's very much like using your intuition and mm -hmm. somebody once told me, um, and I think it was Sean Callagy, mm -hmm. um, he who is the most certain wins. Mm -hmm. And I feel in my experience when it comes to investing, it's yeah. the same thing, mm -hmm. right? Like I am certain, I know I could make this turn around, right? Like the, the right. one... I referenced to you in our prior conversation that was making mm -hmm. 50 bucks a month and my husband didn't want to buy it. He literally said to me, I don't want to buy this house. Right. And I said, I know it's only making 50 bucks right now, but I promise you, I really think this is going to be something. Right. And, right. 
you know, okay, yeah, we had COVID years, we were, we're done and over with that, and we're have on our first turn, and on our first turn, we're turning around and more than doubling the rent. Right. Yeah. So, so that's amazing. So I want to kind of unpack what we kind of covered so far. So from you, from getting into real estate to your first investment was about five years, mm -hmm. give or take. You're saying that you could have bridged that gap if you set your intentions and wrote down and focused on what you wanted to focus on. Yeah, so, leave, left, leave space in my life for yep, it, right? A thousand percent. Of, instead of just living my life reactionary to what's happening around me. Yep. Making a conscious effort. And I, you know, and I'll say, I'll tell people who ask me about investing, mm -hmm. you know, cause I say we have a small portfolio, right? To me, it's small cause, cause I want it to be times five or six or 10. Right. Right. Yeah. Um, but we have 21 tenants and when people ask me, I say, I think really what's really important for you is to set aside, you know, an half an hour, an hour a week. Mm -hmm. and just analyze some deals thousand percent yeah. um because i always say to business owners and even even agents like like you said you you would wake up in the morning and you have your task or you set your intentions for the day i also tell agents make sure you write that down the the day before or the night before so you don't want to wake up and think about what you should be doing or shouldn't be doing you should be waking up and hitting the ground running and right. setting your intentions and like you said earlier um you know, running down your intentions. But what you said is really interesting too, is that so many people want to put the cart before the horse. And what I mean by that is you're like, just download as much uh, real estate investing information as you possibly can and be surrounding yourself with people having those conversations. So when the opportunity presents itself, you can you speak the language or it just comes out of you. You're that fear barrier or the, the analysis paralysis will be a lot less, you know, that barrier of entry will be a lot less, but so many people don't want to put the time up front just to surround themselves or consume that information. So those opportunities, when they do come, they're like, Oh my God, what, what do I do? Can I, can I do this? You know, but like I said, you, you did the research and you just, you set your intentions and you started reading, listening. So when the opportunity came, you were able to jump on it as well. Yeah, I think, yes. And, um, and also, you know, as a real estate broker, right, driving people mm -hmm. around, you, I have learned and, you know, God, I got licensed in 21, right? So mm -hmm. 2001. So I have learned to be able to say to people, you know, I know that you think this is what you're looking for, but humor me and let's just see everything in that area mm -hmm. in that price range mm -hmm. so that you become a better buyer right you're because building... that way you're gonna not you're it's gonna reduce your second guessing yourself when the right, right. one comes along mm -hmm. and i think it's the same principle in investing yep um and also a little bit more it it requires, listen, I was the teenager who was jumping off a train trestle at two, three in the morning with my friends, right? Cause we had a bonfire. <laughs> yeah. That's not for everybody. <laughs> mm -hmm. Real estate can be that way. True. Um, oh yeah. You have a little bit of, all right, I've analyzed it. I'm pretty certain that this is what I'm, I'm going to make. Cause for us, it's passive income. That's our model. Sure. Um, which as you know, there's more than one model in investing. Yeah, I definitely wanted to tap into that to see what is your model. We'll get to that though. Yeah, yeah we'll get to that. So our, our model's passive income, right? So is, if I'm making money at a certain point in time, I, you cannot mitigate all of the risks. It's just right. not it's gonna impossible. happen. It's impossible, right. It's an yeah. impossibility. Right. So if you don't wanna deal with tenants and tenants' lives and what that looks like, then don't invest in real estate or yeah invest in a real estate investment trust right right like do it other yeah. other ways separate yourself correct yeah. right now yes you can get a property manager however mm -hmm. that's going to take up some of your well, profit I, I mean honestly like let's look at this depending on your model right if you're, mm -hmm. you're short-term rental that's going to take up 15 to 25 percent of your profit mm -hmm. depending on the market right um if if it's long-term, you know, 
if it's long term, then you're probably looking at at least eight to 10%. Mm -hmm. And you have less control over like, there's something about seeing it, smelling it. Yeah, you know what I mean, like phys the physicality of it. Like, I love mm -hmm. the physicality of it. But right now, all of ours are within an hour of us. So we can have that ability to have the physicality. If I'm investing, let's say in Pittsburgh, which I know a ton of people are throwing their money that way, mm -hmm. then I'm going to look for a different rate of return on my investment because I know that I'm going to pay 8%. Right, right, right. Um, so let's, let's talk about different methods. Do you, so you're, you're strictly looking for the passive income. So you're not necessarily doing, are you doing flips or are you just, you're doing a little bit of both, but majority of the time it's trying to create that passive income. No, I just did this in 20, 22, 23, I did my first flip. Um, and what okay. happened was we had been for a couple of years had been saying, oh, we should do a flip. We should do a flip. Right. Just again, just spouting stuff off and not yeah. actually putting it in the action. plan. And, <laughs> yeah. um, and so I was, t I had turned a few tenants, right? So I had this period of time where it's one March where I had turned like three tenants in three weeks. So mm -hmm. I was like, boom, boom, boom. I got to get in and get out and I got to get this done. I got to get that done. And after doing that, because of course my husband's like, there's no way you're not turning these apartments in this one apartment in two weeks. There's no way. And I was like, trust me, I got it. <laughs> so after turning the apartment in two weeks, um, I was like, you know, I really feel like we should do a flip. And um, fast forward, I'm helping my son buy a two family and we're looking at property and one came on in Allentown, Pennsylvania in the historic district. It was a three family. The rents were $500 a month each wow. and it was cash flowing at $500 a month each. And market rent was like a thousand easy, wow. easily a thousand. And so I said, we have to buy this. And my, my husband's a commercial lender. He's a banker, right? So he's always risk. He's yeah. always like, pull back, pull back, which just keeps me safe. It's better. It's better <laughs> in the long run. Like we have a, this like nice little dance that we've learned how to do. And I've learned how to push him out of the way. But mm -hmm. um, so he was like, there's no, you cannot buy that. I go, I think we should just write an offer. And he says, don't write an offer until you see it. That's ridiculous. So I make an appointment and 24 hours later, because it's Pennsylvania and there's no attorney review, mm -hmm. I get a notification that says property went under contract, no further showings. And I was so, and then he takes me to meet a client of his that night and his client's a real estate investor and who has bigger buildings and stuff. And he made me, <laughs> I know you're recording this, this is funny. So he, you're going to laugh though. It's a, this will translate. People will love this story. Okay. Gotcha. So, <laughs> so he made me like two or three Manhattans and I don't drink like that. Like I'm right. short and five, two and three quarters. Like. I'm one Manhattan is way plenty for me, but I was <laughs> angry inside because I kept thinking like he just totally dismissed me and we missed out on an opportunity mm. and the entire evening through the whole conversation, all I could hear repeatedly in my brain in my, everything was fate favors the bold. Mm. So I come home, I'm three sheets to the wind. <laughs> I <laughs> three, three Manhattans in three Manhattans in I check my email and there's an email from an agent who someone on my team showed this investment property it was like $88,000 or something and she said hey hey girl now as you know when you have good relationships with the real estate community mm -hmm. we're always trying to like make sure that we're looking out for people that we have a good relationship with right so the agent emails me and said hey I just want to make sure that you're not intending on putting in an offer because we have offers on the table, but if you're interested, you know, let mm. me know because it's only going to take a couple thousand dollars and it's yeah. yours. So I wrote an offer, sent it over. She sent it back the next morning signed. And I went, Oh, I now have to tell my husband, I just bought a house. 
So under I, under the influence. <laughs> I send a text message. No, you're gonna laugh. I send a text message to him and my boys and my boys. So the long story, my boys' best friends, this boys they grew up with that mm. their mother passed. So I'm like their surrogate mother. Mm. Where I was like, hey, you know how we've always talked about doing a project together? So I am thinking that this would be really great. I just bought this house. I love your pitch. I love we your should pitch. have a family meeting and talk about like who wants to go in on it. Oh my, oh my God. That's hilarious. It like, is hilarious. So I'm sure that year and a half of, you know, of blood, sweat and tears and learning a lot of lessons, cutting my teeth on it. My husband was maybe not so thrilled with me at times. Hmm. Yeah. He but, be, yeah. It's, you know what? You can blame it on him because uh, he gave you the three Manhattans, right? And that is what I said. I yes. said, let me just buy this <laughs> cat flying multi. It's all his fault. <laughs> this would not have happened. Yeah, exactly. And, but now he's like, you know, what? I, listen, I bought another one before the month, and he was all in. He was like, I'm in, right? So, we bought another one the month before we sold that one. And then we bought another one two days afterwards. Nice. So, That's so now, he, now he now like pushing him to the edge of his comfort zone. Right. And now he has a level of comfort. And so now things are moving. That's and great. now you have insight into my marriage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just I, I have a question for you, Teresa. Now, when when you're doing the flip, now, obviously, one of the biggest hesitations with people I speak with, like if, especially if they're not handy themselves, learning to trust or get that right, the right contractors in place, mm -hmm. right? Because that can make or break your profit. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How did you go about finding those people? What, did you feel comfortable with them right off the bat? Was it a developed relationship or was it work you've seen over time? Like, how did that work out for you guys? Um, it was a mixed bag. Okay. Um, when... I decided about six months in, I did, I came to the realization that I was going to have to put my big girl panties on and take over the project in its entirety because hmm. it wasn't going to get to fruition anytime soon. If I left it up to the boys and my husband and, and me telling them what to do and them going there on Saturday mornings for four hours and working and then going for lunch and drinks, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like it was just, yeah. It wasn't their labor of love, right? Like right, they were right. like, all right, yes, mom wants us to do this. Sounds like a great idea. And yeah, yeah. So at that point, I, um, I had had, you know, like I have had an electrician I was working with prior to that because of the rental properties. I had mm -hmm. a plumber I have a longstanding relationship with. Um, I actually put a post on a Facebook group for local contractors to interview. Mm. and found one that ironically enough i had no i met him in high school hadn't seen him in 30 years and mm. um he came out and obviously was out of work we worked out a week rate and i thought okay let's let me give him four weeks and see what happens mm. and now we have now you know like i now i know his every <laughs> So be like in doing the projects with contractors, it's sort of like you have to understand they're each different individual people oh, yeah. and have an individual psychology and mm -hmm. an individual style. And you have to wear like, it's like being a real estate agent. You have to be the psychologist. You have yeah. to, you have to be able to say, okay, I know that pressure is going to motivate this one. Mm -hmm. And I know that appreciation and gratitude are going to motivate this one. Right, right. And I know that I have to tell this one so many times in order to get something done. You know what I mean? Like, it's just yeah. it's sort of like learning project management, right? Sure. Right. Yeah. Um, so method wise, are you are you a Burr method? Is that kind of like what you like to do? Or are you, are you financing? Like what, what kind of method are you using when you're purchasing properties? Um, so on the finance end, like, yeah. um, well, I, we generally, thinking about this, we generally buy things that need work. Right. And because then I could, you know, 
I'm buying it at a better discount. I'm willing mm -hmm. to tolerate the loss of capital to reinvest into the place to turn the rents. Do you know what I mean? Right. Yep. Yep. Um, so that's been where we make our most money, where we've made most of our money that way. Because okay. then, then you cash out, you know, then you can say, okay, yeah. let me refinance later and take some equity out and use that for, you know, the mm -hmm. next thing right. or, you know, yeah. what's happening in our lives. Have you seen that the interest rates and the, the new interest rates have really started to squeeze those margins a little bit? more than obviously usual Hundred our... percent. like i okay. i don't see like we we generally when we look at something we're kind of like at quick glance before we put it in our you know because we have a an excel schematic mm -hmm. right? we, we have it uh, i don't even know what you call it but like you know something yep. in excel my husband put together so we could type in the rents the taxes the expenses and it tells us you know, what our mortgage payment's gonna be and mm -hmm. what our rate of return is, you know, what our monthly profit's gonna be and all the things right. with vacancies and stuff like that. Right. So, um, I, we generally quick glance are 1%. Like I know if they're getting $1,500 a month rent, right. I'm not really gonna wanna pay more than $150,000 for that property. Right. So you're using the 1% the rule a lot of the times. Yeah, yeah. yes. It, with exception, right? Because right. the one that I'm renovating right now, we were making 50 bucks a month. Like, mm -hmm. it was not, he was not happy with me for a couple years. <laughs> um, and now he's like, oh, that $1,100 a month is now turning into $2,400 a month on just one unit. And that surpasses, now we're making, you know, Right. Six hundred dollars a month off of just one unit, and then the next unit is going to be all profit. So yeah. Now he's like, "That's a really nice number." <laughs> <laughs> and I, th I think I think that's a big mi mix uh, misconception about uh, people looking to get right into real estate, depending on the method that you're doing, too. Especially like, say you're flipping, you're flipping a property, you're making, you know. Yes, you can put more money, you can put money in your pocket quicker, but there's also problems with that because then you capital gains, you got taxes, you say you got closing fees. So even if you're flipping, you might put a little bit more money in your pocket sooner, but there's it's going to come at a cost. So there's also when you when you're doing like the buy and hold method like you're doing, is that you especially because you don't get tax on when you're refinancing as well. So you're you're planting seeds of long-term growth and i think a lot of people think that um it's going to ha obviously hey i'm going to flip this property make a ton of money and then i got to go repeat it again you're not you're not really planting seeds of wealth down the line if that's what your what your plan is yeah. so um but you would say majority of your method is is planning for long-term wealth and compounding growth. Yeah, like this is my retirement, right? I've been yeah. selling real estate for 20, what is it, 23 years now, something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. And um, I don't have a 401k, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like I just didn't do that, you know, married and divorced twice. And mm -hmm. um, just, you know, starting over, starting over, starting over. And so for me, I look at it like, okay, well, if my rent rolls bring me X amount of dollars a year, then mm -hmm. whether I whether I hit max depreciation or not, do I really care? Right. You know, yeah. I mean, and, and, and maybe the game will be for us, once we hit max depreciation, then we sell in bulk and mm -hmm. 1031, yep. you know, that will remain to be seen, but, right. um, you have options. I have options. Yeah, that's great. And honestly, you know, 401ks and stuff like that, you know, people are, who even people who even have 401ks are probably like, uh Oh, like I need some other options here now. Right. So, and I, um, yeah, I think obviously real estate is a, a great investment. You just got to be strategic and understand that there is going to be, there's going to be risk and there's things that are uncontrollable, especially when it comes, even when you mentioned different personalities, as well. It's not a, uh, a set it and forget it kind of situation mm -hmm. by any means. Um, no. And some of my, and you know, and some of my guys are, you know, you got to get scrappy sometimes, right? 
Yeah. And so I do that well. And so of my guys, you know, they vacillate. Like I could have a project they're working on and I'm like so happy. And the next time I'm like, let me know how much time you think it's going to take you to do this. And then they send me an estimate and I'm like, you know, cussing out the storm. I'm like, are you kidding me? What do you yeah. think? I'm stupid. Like, <laughs> what are you thinking? Yeah. Like you, like I've employed you for the last, you know, eight months full time, pretty much like, right. what? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, it can get interesting quick. Uh, was, there, are... was there anything early on that you made huge mistakes and you just, you would go back in time and change anything like as far as investing or trusting um, or? Well, as far as investing, what would I change? I would have done it sooner and done more of it. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and 2012 would have been a really great year to buy a lot of real estate. <laughs> sure. It sure would have been. Yeah. 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 Um, and so that I regret, there was a lot of talk and not a lot of action then. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I think for me cutting my teeth on the, like the flipping, um, I definitely have learned a lot about project management and setting expectations. And listen, anytime you're doing project management, it doesn't matter how much you plan for. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it just doesn't matter. Like no. it's the proverbial, it'll be done next week. Yep. And, right. And you know, like just this, just this week, my, I had the floors refinished at one of the properties. We talked about color and I said to my floor guy, please call me, let me know okay, we'll go with this color, but I'm fine. If you need to call me and tell me that natural's not going to work here. Mm -hmm. And I didn't get a phone call. So I'm always so excited. And I bring, and I forget what night after two days, I said to my husband, Oh, I want to go down. I want to check on it. Please just, can we go check on it? And he's like, God, this is so annoying. Why do you always want to check on everything all the time? So it's just me. I love it. I love that. Right. And so right. I go down there and I walk in and I'm like, I flip and hate this. I'm like, this looks terrible. I'm like, I can see all the old stains from where the old radiator was. I can't believe he didn't call me. So I'm sending him text messages on like, you know, Saturday night. Mm -hmm. John, I need you to call me in the morning. And so I'm like, we're gonna re we have to redo these. So now we have to talk about cost. And he was smart enough to say, I'm not gonna charge you to redo them. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, cause he's like, I want you to be happy. Right, cause he knows he just did my last one. And I have two more waiting for him. Like, so it's not. Right. That's a, that's a smart businessman, smart. right? You want to have that continued business and those relationships over time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, um, now that meant I had to cancel my appliance delivery, push back the countertop insulation, push the plumber back, push back showings. Cause I was getting it to the point where I could start to show it to get it you know, occupied. Right. And so that's going to kick the can down the road. They're down there supposedly today working on it, but that still means I can't walk in it for at least two days. You're right. So, you know, you can't, that's the stuff that you, you can never, you can never plan for that. Right. 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 You can always in your head say, okay, my target occupancy date is March 1st or sale date. And, mm. you know, there's yeah. not a, you don't have a hundred percent control over that. Right. And I think, I think it also depends because Jay, you said something about investors who like to get in and do a quick flip. Mm -hmm. And I realized that might seem easy -er and mm -hmm. less risky and less costly, but I, I see, I challenge that mindset, right? The last mm -hmm. one. Now I could have done the last one in six months. I will agree with that but it took me longer because we thought we were doing it all ourselves. Right. <laughs> but there were things that I think karmically, you know, I took a step back and said, I can't possibly put luxury vinyl here. Mm. I can't possibly do this. Like I have to stay, it was a, a 1900 build. I'm like, I have to stay with the integrity of what makes this house beautiful and right. and look at it like it's going to be a gift for the community and a gift for the next buyer and as a result of that you know mm -hmm. 
that what I ended up selling it for was that, like I made the market there. That's right. That's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, I, I think also knowing obviously the house you're working with and also the surrounding area that is it going to support the money and time that I'm going to be putting into this property as well. And that comes from your experience and your intuition. You knew that, Hey, if I give a little bit more time, you know, quality over quantity kind of situation, um, it will, it will work, work out. So that's great. Yeah. And um, I think Jeff, to your, to your point about like, what did you learn? Sometimes things happen. Like we've got in that we got into the last place and we called the plumber electrician and the plumber first and the plumber electrician comes in and I'm like, look, just get me up and running. I don't need, I, I'm going to need to redo this whole electric panel, but in the meantime, mm. I need an outlet on every floor. Right. And right. So he gets me up and running and then I call the plumber in and the plumber and when the electrician goes to come in, he says, I can't do anything for you until we replace the conduit outside because mm -hmm. water is pouring into your electric Oof. pot. Oh, so boy. then that was a delay. Yep. So we had to fix that first. And so we finally get that fixed. I call the plumber and the plumber says, I'm shutting down your water because your service line from the street is bellied. It's going to explode at any time. Oof, geez. So then I had to have the service replaced from the street to the house. And that took a little time and navigating. I was able to get it covered under the grant for the state of New Jersey because they have that whole like lead initiative where mm. if there's any galvanized, they'll replace it for free. Right. But I had to coordinate that. And so that like shut us down for a while. Sure. Right. Anytime you, know? you involve the state, it's going to shut you down for a while. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so you said something earlier about, you know, we were talking about contractors and you said uh, something about the contractor and the floor. I think there's also levels to the, uh, to the contractors that you surround yourself with and also the team you build within those contractors is like, you know, for instance, when I look at certain things, especially like, like contractors that are, you know, working on projects and stuff like that, I want them to be problem solvers as well. And for instance, if they see a floor, like, hey, you're on the team, you're on my team, we're, we're going to be moving on different projects here and there. If you see a problem that you know that I, I before I see it, it's not going to fly, then don't wait for me to get to the property and then me find it, right? Like, or are... don't wait until we close the wall. <laughs> Only to later have to open the wall because you right. didn't flip and tell me the right thing to do was replace right. the broken pipe. Yep. Right. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So I think I, you know, if contractors or anyone's looking for this and they want to build a long-term relationship, if you can be boots on the ground and a problem solver as well, um, to be part of the team and keep moving the team forward into next projects, that is a huge aspect of the evolution of becoming, you know, the contractor and stuff like that. So, um, and I think too, is like, if it, they don't do that, you're like, you're carrying all that weight and you have to go see the property late on a Saturday night. And, you know, that's. To me, that's not the best team member for for the projects moving forward. And so it's funny you say that because mm. I had I had to learn I learned this, right? Mm. Like it, it took me going through it to realize that I had to have a conversation with everybody, really, like my plumber. I had to say, hey, on the next property, do you think before we get there that you and I could sit down, I'll buy you lunch and come up with a checklist together of mm -hmm. what I want you to look at and go through on my properties from now on? Yep. That, so that I know that there's like a standard operating procedure when I call you and I say, I need you to go give it a once over for me, mm -hmm. that that once over looks like this. Right. Right. Because I don't, I, I'm not a plumber. I'm not an electrician. I'm not an HVAC guy. Like I don't know. Like I have. I don't know enough. Mm -hmm. You know, right. going into it, I didn't know enough. So same thing with the HVAC guy. I'm like, you just built a chase in two of my rooms without even asking me. Like I, we had walls open. I would have told you to put it in the wall. Like I would have spent an extra. How you know? If you said to me, this ductwork is really shoddy. Spend yeah. the extra whatever to make it right if you're ever planning on putting central air in here. Yeah. Then I would have done it instead mm -hmm. of waiting till I had a buyer who asked me to negotiate, tried to negotiate central air only for me to find out I can't put it in the system the way that it is because it's not adequate for central air. Right. 
you know? Yeah. So setting expectations of what you're looking for and making sure that they are actually team members and not just contractors you're hiring. Because um, so a lot of them will say, oh, this is just a rental or this is just a flip. Mm. And because they encounter other people mm -hmm. who, when they do something, want to do the cheapest, fastest way possible. And right. then I have to explain to them, I'm a real estate broker. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm licensed to sell homes to people. I don't want to do anything that would jeopardize my license. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to do anything that someone could come back and say, I knew better. And right. so for me, the product, the output is going to be different than someone else. And so it's not just a rental. Like this is my, really, it's like my future, right? Yeah. It's not just a rental. It's not just a flip. It, this is a home we're handing off to someone. And I want, you know, when someone sees that it's my name, I want them to know mm. that this means it's going to be done right. Right. Standards. And to, and, and to that point, Teresa, there, you know, there's a number of people in our industry that do the same type of thing. And quite honestly, when I see their name on a flip, I don't want to bring my clients there. And I'm for, uh, forthcoming about it because they do horrible, shoddy cover up work. That's what I'm saying. It's like right. terrible. Right. I, right. I feel like, so I actually ran into, it's funny because we had the whole central air thing that happened. And I thought about, like I deliberated, do I open the walls right. after we finish this product and do it now or do I let it go? Mm -hmm. And it was like the one regret I had, like I have two regrets on that property. That is the one, one of them is that I didn't, I wasn't there with the HVAC guy to walk through and have the conversation. And I trusted him mm -hmm. and um, he made a quick, fast, easy, cheap decision. And, um, and so fast forward, I'm buying two of the attached two of the properties next door. I'm buying them. Mm -hmm. And so I was there and I ran into the new owner who asked me, gee, um, this one room doesn't get warm like the other rooms. Do you know anything about that or how I could fix that? Mm -hmm. And I just had to be honest with her. I was like, you know, it was like one of my regrets that I didn't realize that you know, the ductwork is different sizes in different places. Mm. And I didn't, I didn't know that until we had finished the product and would have had to reopen the walls. So the only way for you to really fix it is to open up the wall and replace the ductwork in that one side of the house, the, mm -hmm. you know, the one right. outside wall of the house. I'm like, or I happen to know that there's a dead outlet. There's an empty outlet on the opposite side of the bathroom that no, that we covered up that mm. can be tapped into. I'm like, if you're looking for auxiliary heat, you can just put an electric strip in there and have it wired to that outlet. And then you have extra heat in that one room, mm. you know, but I didn't like, like, I don't want to be running into people and having them say, you know, you're the jerk that renovated my yeah. house. Reputation right. is everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you, so just to touch on you, you're up to 22 properties right now or in, in that mark. Tenant. Yeah. yeah. Tenant, tenants. And you, what is your advice? So in regards to you do, it's, you're operating in an area that you, that you know. Mm -hmm. So are you thinking long-term that you're going to branch out into other States or are you going to, yeah. and if you are going to branch out in other States, what do you think needs to happen for you to feel comfortable to purchase in those states? Well, that depends on who you ask me or my husband. Um, <laughs> How many uh, Manhattans do we need? How many exactly. Manhattans? So um, I already have markets that I like. Mm -hmm. Not and, and you just got to know how I roll. I am not the data head. Like I just sort of like get a little bit of intuition and, and enough information that I can, I kind of know, like I love Indiana. Mm. Um, and I have a, a real estate colleague, he's actually a real estate coach that now that has a hundred doors and he buys in Detroit. And I think that would be a great place to buy. Mm. Um, I think Pittsburgh is a great place to buy. Milwaukee is another potential, you know, mm. actually I think, you know, St. Louis even. Mm. So I think there's places all like really 
you know, it's really a matter of what you're looking for. Right. And I think, I think you can find it as long as you're willing to travel for it. Mm -hmm. So what would have to happen for me? Um, so for me, it's really just finding, probably finding some wholesalers or finding some real estate agents in those mm -hmm. areas that could tell me a little bit, like, I don't, I don't even have to visit it, but mm -hmm. if I do, you know, ideally it would be to take a flight and just kind of scope out and then kind of pick my areas. Yeah. But, um, I would be okay not doing that. My husband probably wouldn't. <laughs> um, and I would have to have a property management relationship yeah. in place. Like I right. could send my contractors. I'm not worried about that. I have some guys that live in one of my units that I could be like, Hey, I'm sending you for a month. I need you to go do this, you know, mm. and I pay them their, whatever our agreed upon week rate is. So, right. Nice. Uh, is there, is there a price point that you look for specifically in those markets? Or are you comfortable across? It's really just a matter of the cash flow. Right. right. Like I, right. So like the Detroit one in the ninth mile, three bedroom ranch um, in, in a, in a more up and coming neighborhood, just outside of the eighth mile. Right. Um, you could pick up a three bedroom ranch for $125,000 and your, wow. and your monthly okay. rent is like 1350, $1,400. Mm. Okay. So, I mean, yeah. that's, that's not bad. No, not at all. In, in an area where they're there, that's an appreciation game. You're cash flowing enough and you're, and, and you have some appreciation. Right. Mm -hmm. I keep saying Camden, New Jersey, but my husband refuses Camden. As a former, <laughs> as a former cop, I'm a, I'm not going there. <laughs> but he says, he goes, you want to do it? You go collect rent. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, is they do you in the future do you have a threshold of even because even your local area where you hit a, a number of tenants to where you're like maybe i don't have any more time where the eight to ten percent of property management might be worth, worth it, it at yeah. that point so Are i'm there i kind of feel like so this year for us after we close up where i have four projects running simultaneously like rental and flip Mm -hmm. um, and so once they get tied up and I get restabilized, it the game for us is then going to be okay. Let's I don't know. I say I say defragment, right? Like let's look at everything. Where are our rent rolls? What's been? Where can the rent rolls go to? What capital improvements have been made? What needs to get made? What properties do we have insurance plans on? Because I have a program through HomeServe. You should check them out. Mm. Uh, on some of my properties, but I don't think I have it on all of them. And so that is one of the things that like they'll cover $750 of a water heater replacement. They'll cover per per portion of the furnace, sewer lines, all those things for not a lot of money, like $45 a month all in. Right. Um, and so that kind of stuff, like just kind of reevaluating and saying, here's where we need to put some money. Here's where we can make some extra money with raising rents. Um, mm. Here's what we want to get rid of. So once we do all of that, um, I feel like that will, you know, mm. once that happens, then we'll be more poised for. Right. Mm -hmm. So you're basically looking, you need to get, tie up a couple of loose ends to get a clear picture of what you got going on. Um, do you, do you have a standard system of increasing rent? Is that like a, you know, 2% year over year, or you just go by case by case basis on a property? Um, we've been doing case by case basis. So, mm -hmm. um, that's right. One of the things, I mean, I build in, I always, when I'm doing release, I always build in that there's a minimum increase of, you know, 25, $50. Um, mm -hmm. but that's part of one of the things we have to decide. Um, yeah. it's been really like, in, and we purchased Buildium and they've started building that program for us so that we could get everything up and running on there. The only thing that it doesn't do is house our leases, but I'm okay with that. Mm. Um, cause I think that will help us be able to look at it, you know, from a bigger picture. Right. And, and yeah. It. Yeah. I was going to say, my next question is how are you, how are you keeping track of everything? Like. That's, that's gotta be a job on its own, you know, 
So we have, um, we've been blessed that we haven't had to do too many evictions, um, but we have had some. And so we're in the middle of one right now. And my husband said, the court sent me a, they sent me a request for the landlord tenant registration form. He's like, did we register this with this, the town? And I'm like, I don't know. Did you register it with the town? Like mm. I, I could tell you that I spent the time to go register a bunch of our tenants at, in this particular town, mm -hmm. but it's been a while. So I don't know if that included this tenant or didn't include this tenant. So we've been sort of, to answer your question, we've been sort of like haphazardly mm -hmm. um, taking responsibility of different things and sometimes it shifts. And so I really right. like, you know, 2024, Jeff, like I said, purposeful. Yeah, and, dialed you know, in. Yeah, purposeful for me in 2024 is getting really clear on what we have what needs to happen, whose responsibility, what is going to mm -hmm. be. And, um, and I'm noticing that it's taking, you know, at this stage because of the construction happening, mm -hmm. it's taking a lot more of my time than it had in the, had in the past. Yeah. So I've been a proponent of, of hiring out for the last couple of years and he's been resistant. So I think once this is all sort of restabilized, we'll be able to, to yeah, say okay right. let, now and let's at least hire somebody even if it's not a property full-time property management company let's at least hire a you know mm -hmm. hire someone part-time to take some of this load off right you said something a second ago about evictions and for brand new investors say they're working on you know their first property um that could really yeah, really hurt an investor pretty quick, you know, depending on if, if, even if they didn't run their numbers properly and they're only making 50 to 50 bucks a month, you know, uh, on cash flow, or they're even just breaking even someone stops paying that rent and then they, you know, are they able to cover that, that, that loan, you know? So it's how you said you went through some evictions like but you know how long have they normally taken for you and do they really put a stress on the um you know the profitability of that property um so in the traditional sense the evictions haven't really taken us that long okay uh, usually if as long as you file after five days we've been pretty good pretty lucky about being able to get in front of a judge within 30 days of the filing. Okay. Um, but entree COVID and we had several tenants, you know, and that's a whole other, like, I'll try to, I'll try to temper what I say about <laughs> COVID and being in the state of New Jersey. Yeah. Um, but we had several tenants who were working and not paying. Mm -hmm. And when we finally got court dates for them. DCA contacted us and said, we're throwing out your court date. You can't go back after this money. Wow. Um, that can just, that could destroy somebody. Jay, literally, I was so angry. I was threatening to burn my own property down. Like, <laughs> because we, you know, they said there's relief money but the relief money didn't apply to the landlords. It only right. applied to corporate landlords who had more than 30 tenants. Jeez. So, okay, I can't get relief, but I still have to pay my mortgages and I still have to pay my property taxes. And you're not letting me go after them. You're not letting me evict them for not paying for the last year. Mm -hmm. And so we were lucky enough that the the people who did that once, once the, once DCA threw the court case out, we filed again the next month and then they both, you know, they, they fled, um, mm. just left in the middle of the night kind of thing. Wow. But, um, Crazy. Yeah. Yeah. So since then <laughs> there was a bit of a backlog of getting into court, mm -hmm. uh, but I think we just had one recently in the last month that my, my husband went online, filed for himself, and um, we got a court date. Well, no, we don't have the court date yet, but we did get communication about the tenant registration form. Mm. And so we'll see what happens. I sent it 
they, obviously we didn't have, he did not have the tenant registration form filled out and notarized by the clerk. So they may throw out the case and he may have to repay the filing fee again to refile. But um, mm. yeah. It's a, it's definitely a risk. I mean, on average with, without COVID, how many, how many months on average do you think you're down on rent roll because of an eviction on a property? Like two months, three months? I would say plan three months. Three months. Yeah. Cause yeah. then even people who aren't paying generally usually are the kind of people who may not leave it. <laughs> Tidy. <laughs> right. Um, so you don't yeah. want to, you know, three, three months I would say is a minimum. I mean, they always tell you, right. Sometimes when you're, when you're purchasing them, some of the underwriters require a six month reserve. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, but some don't. So, and it depends on your risk tolerance. Yeah. You know, it might, you know, for us, we have a higher risk tolerance than most people. I would, mm -hmm. oh, I don't know most people, but then they, more than the average. So right. for us, that might mean, hey, I don't pay my taxes for these few properties for, you know, maybe I'm late on paying my taxes or my water sewer bills mm -hmm. while we're bridging the gap, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Trying to move some numbers around, trying to make it work. Mm -hmm. um, makes sense. Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, I think that is probably one of the, you know, obviously it's such an unknown, you know, when it comes down to evictions and, you know, they stop paying. And I think that, uh, that's something you really can't predict, you know, things happen, right? You have to have a lot of faith and you have to have a lot of trust <laughs> yeah. and we're from New Jersey, so we don't have either so, one. <laughs> <laughs> but it makes us scrappy, Jeff. I mean, I agree with that, you know, I agree with that. I'm in some of these uh, landlord groups on like Facebook groups, mm -hmm. people from across the country and some of the questions and mindset, like I'm, I'm just really shocked, right? That people ask the questions that they ask that it's not common sense or, you know, that they're afraid to, do I need to replace this piece of rotten wood in the wall after the water leaked? Like what? Yeah, you is that a question? Not, yeah, you, yeah. You should not be owning real estate. Oh my god, you know. But yeah. I, I, I guess I have to look at it like this. Listen, I got into real estate when my ex-husband went to prison for drunk driving, and mm. I was a stay-at-home mom, and I had to do something fast and flexible, and you know, make it work. Mm. So for me, there was like no choice. It was just I have to make this work. Right. Uh, and that that gave me a certain maybe it built a certain muscle in my life certain mm -hmm. mindset. Um, yeah. and I'm so blessed for it. Like I'm so grateful that that happened because if that didn't happen, I don't think I would have endured. And mm. I don't think I'm so grateful for having contact with what happens in and around real estate. Mm. Right. Like I'm, I'm a person who will get weepy when I say the preamble to the, code of ethics for the national association of realtors because underneath it all is land. Mm -hmm. and, and when you let that, when you think about the impact of that, like so much of our economy in this country is around real estate, around, mm -hmm. around shelter and around, you know, which, whether it's primary residence or rental properties, there's so much economy that happens as a result of it. It's, it's all inspiring. And I'm so grateful that, you know, my ex was an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's funny. But it's true. It's so true. I think a lot of people, a lot of agents who um, survive in this industry or prosper in this industry are the people that the agents that have the, the story or even investors that have a story where their back was against the wall and they, they pushed through, right? They, and I, I there's so many successful agents that have a similar, a similar backstory to why they got in it and they endured because this, obviously this industry is not easy whatsoever. And so many people outside think it is, but it, you know, we'll tell you right now it is not. So having that perseverance mentality and knowing that, and, and basically saying to yourself, Hey, no matter what happens, I'm going to push through. I'm going to, I'm going to make this thing work. So, um, and then neck, and like you said, that can translate into so many different things or aspects of your life. So that's, uh, that's amazing. So, 
Do you think it's important to say, I know we're like on our hour, but um, I think it's important to say to people who are thinking about investing, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of frauds out there. Yeah. There are many people in the real estate coaching world, real estate Mm -hmm. investor coaching world Mm -hmm. that started coaching investors in real estate before they actually did it themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. And just let that land. It's all good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have you have to do your due diligence on who you're listening to. Yeah. It's, you know, uh, it, it's you, you, there's and so they're, many and they're in big the tickets. They're big tickets. Like oh, yeah. paying twenty five thousand dollars to get into a program and yep. Yeah. And the thing too is like there's so many books and there's so many YouTube uh channels and stuff where you can m- mostly probably get the information you need to make a decision on whether or not what direction you want to go on real estate investing. There's so much out there, but I think like you said, there are coaching programs and stuff out there that are dangerous and they just take people's money because it's an easy way out. People are like, if I just spend this money, I'm going to learn everything I need to know. And I'm going to be a real estate investor. Now, and I think they're just feeding off the, the easy ticket kind of situation. Like if I do this, I'm going to know all this, but it's usually not the case at all in anything. No. no. And if you, and, and listen, there's a time and a place where you want to pay someone for their expertise because it's mm. going to accelerate you. Right. Right. Um, right. But I, I just know that I would prefer like there's, there is you. There is nothing. No amount of information that you can consume that can replace the nervous system response in your body yes. from being responsible for. I bought this. I have to invest only this into it, and I'm trying to make money, and I'm dealing with the contractors, and I'm dealing with timelines, and I'm. And I'm going like this inside of my stomach, like mm-hmm. until you've done that, mm-hmm. it's, it, it's not the same advice necessarily that True. you get from someone who's never done it. Who's just selling you a program. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah. It's like being on a, on a tarmac, knowing all the information, all the instruments of a plane, but until you take off and you do it yourself to a point and you, like you said, you, you build those uh, uh, pathways in your mind and, the stress factors and your cortisol levels are shooting through the roof, you know, and let, that is, that's going to be the biggest learning curve is just getting, getting into the mix. As Jay, much as, no offense. I'm not getting in a plane with you. Right. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> I promise it's got wings, man. It's got wings. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, Teresa, is there, is there anything you would like to, to say or any advice um, you would like to give before we, we hop off today's, call no i would just say you know life is meant to be lived at the edge of your comfort zone and and you know at a certain point in time like you just have to take that leap of faith you know Mm -hmm. yeah and it's a really it's a really real estate is forgiving you know i think Mm -hmm. it is i think it's a lot more forgiving than the stock market you know, yeah. you, can, oh, you yeah. can make a mistake in real estate, but really you still have an asset. Right. True. If, if shit hits the fan, you're like, sell this thing, just to right. sell it, get rid of it. It takes a lot to take a huge loss. Right. Mm-hmm. And, and yes, I know that we had, you know, the savings and loan situation in 2006, seven, eight, whatever, but that really wasn't the real estate market. That was the banking industry. That was yeah. And yeah. now, now the regulations we have in place are because of that. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah, I think also uh, to add on top of what you said uh, is don't be afraid to ask questions. If you don't know something, don't let your ego block you from asking a question. There's no such thing as a stupid question if it's going to get you to the goal you want to you know, be at. Because um, I ask stupid questions all the time, you know, all the time. I can so, attest to that. <laughs> yeah so um but but teresa thank you uh so much for joining jumping on the call with us today we really appreciate it a lot of great information um, i'm so glad you yep. asked me yeah i would love hopefully, to do it yeah, hopefully it was inspiring and not and you know you got you guys got something out of it and 
Well, yeah, you, you, you gave us all sides of it, right? Because it, it's it's not all you know fun and games and glory, and the, there are some failures and risks and pitfalls. That's going to happen. You just have yeah. to be willing to push through those things and persevere on the other side. I just kept saying to myself, like the the one I bought, the first one, right? My first flip. I kept saying, "What's the worst that happens? The worst that happens is I make zero money." Right. And I can turn it into a rental or I turn around and I sell it and I've learned, I learned a ton. Like I, it's what I looked, I looked at it like that. Like I'm not going to be entirely optimal on this because this is my first go round. Right. And like, I don't know, maybe that, maybe that was wrong, but I think that actually served me. Right. Yeah. I, yeah, I, I agree. Cause the thing too, is that, uh, you by you doing that well hey what's the worst case scenario and i think that's important for anyone to do in any industry or anything they're going to get into is what's the worst case scenario and figure that out because if you don't control the mind you will spiral so as soon as that spiral and all chaos and all hell breaks loose and you don't already understand what is your exit strategy um that can get out of hand and you could lose lose your shirt on a couple of things it doesn't matter right. what if it's real estate or anything it's just managing that spiral in, in your mind as well. Right. Therese, yeah. you know what I'm curious about? I know we're winding down here, but that first property you bought, mm -hmm. would you do that same thing today, knowing what you know now? The one that I flipped in my first hold. The first hold? Yes. Okay. Yep. That's awesome. What about the first flip? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. because, because everything was a learning experience, right? What, right. What, what to do different next time. Right. Right. So mm -hmm. amazing. Good. Thank you so much again. Um, and really appreciate the time that you yeah, just took with us today. Yeah, this was awesome, Teresa. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely.